they uh, go through life, when they experience life and the ups and downs and the ins and the outs and the challenges that life, what, what, are, what are other people hoping in? Is it some kind of wishful thinking, pie in the sky, that, you know, everything is just going to work out? Um, maybe, uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not quite sure. I just know this. My hope is Jesus. Uh, uh, he has the answers to life. He has the answers to the, to the world in which we are heading. And uh, for that, I am grateful, and I'm very confident of that. Uh, uh, and I'm, I'm very thankful for that. And so I, I'm happy for, again, a good reminder here this morning by way of that special music. So thank you, Monday family, wherever you get disappeared to. Appreciate it, uh, that challenge here this morning. Great job. All right, we're going to take our Bibles and turn to the book of Psalms, Psalms 27 for our study this morning. And as we are taking our Bibles and turning to that portion of God's Word, I'm going to dismiss youngsters. Yes, they are chomping. They are ready to go. Twelve years of age and under, you can head downstairs to Children's Church. Lord bless you as you go. And thank you, workers, one and all, for your ministry. And if the nursery people are watching as well, thank you, ministry, or the, those that are in the nursery ministering to our young people. Grateful for those uh, unseen servants, uh, but they are certainly seen by the Lord, and we are grateful for them here at Kendall Park Baptist Church. Psalms 27 is the passage of Scripture that you open to, and uh, we trust that the Lord will bless our time together in His Word. Let me, uh, let me just ask you as you're turning to that portion of God's Word. Last week we looked at the Lord is my shepherd. Today we're going to look at the Lord is my salvation. And uh, we're dealing in this area of the confidence of the psalmist in his God. But I came across a story uh, this week, and I thought it was interesting to just kind of take us back to last week with regard to the Lord is my shepherd, a very, very familiar passage of Scripture to many. Many of you have learned it at a young age. You can quote it by memory. Uh, and so I, I came across this little story dealing with uh, what they call the bummer lamb. Anybody ever hear of a bummer lamb? Uh, I, I never did. I've heard of the runt of the litter. I've heard of that, but I never heard of a bummer lamb. But it, apparently it is, it is shepherd talk. It's, it's, it really is language that they use to describe the little lamb that is rejected by his or her mother. And there may be a number of reasons why the ewe uh, would, would reject the little lamb. Maybe, maybe it's a twin. And uh, the mother uh, feels like she can only care for one of the two, and so one is chosen to be really the runt and really left out in the dark. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe there's some other kind of defect, I'm not quite sure. Maybe the mother's old and just not capable at all of caring for that little lamb. But for whatever the reason, the lamb is rejected by, by its own mother. If left in that state, the mother will never care for that. And by the way, you, you might have seen this in other worlds. Uh, I, I think it happens in the dog world anyway, the runt. Uh, they have a big uh, litter. Uh, they're, they're, they're left out. And in the case of a lamb, if, if somebody doesn't take them in and care for them, they'll die. And it really is sad. It's, you know, humanly speaking, it's unfortunate. I would say it's all part of nature. I mean, God, is, uh, God knows all about all this. But I'm happy for shepherds. Shepherds that would take in this little bummer lamb and care for that lamb as if it were their own. And so what they do with that little lamb is they take it in. They actually, from what I read here, take it even into their own home. They hold it near and dear to their chest so it can even sense maybe some kind of a heartbeat there. They feed the lamb, they nurture that lamb, and when that lamb gets strong enough to be put back out in the pasture, the shepherd will then do that. Can you imagine that little lamb hearing the voice of a shepherd? Come, or don't do that, or whatever they might say. I don't know what shepherds speak, but I know this. There's going to be at least one lamb that recognizes the shepherd's voice. And I dare say, that lamb of all lambs will probably be one of the more obedient, faithful, quick to follow sheep of the whole flock or the whole pasture there. You know, there's a picture there, isn't there? 
we are people who are filled with sin. We were born with sin. It's not something that you chose to do. You were born a sinner. I was born a sinner. And because of that sin, we are rejected by a holy God. It's not because he didn't love us. No, no, he did love us. And he was longing to, to, to meet our need. And I'm so thankful that, that our shepherd, by way of his grace and mercy, did reach down from the glories of he heaven and, and brought us to himself. I think the greatest picture what this shepherd was willing to do was even to die, to give his life for his sheep. That's how much this shepherd cared for this sheep. That was us. And so he nurtured us. He's cared for us. He's met our every need. He's put us back out. Question, do we hear his voice? Is he speaking to us? How has he spoken to you this last week? What has he said? Now, I could tell you what he says, because we have a, a record of his voice. Uh, I know how he speaks. Sometimes it's a still, small voice. Sometimes it's through another person. Uh, sometimes it's maybe certain situations that you face, and yet you can hear God shouting. But have you heard the shepherd's voice? Are you following? Could you say, as David said, the Lord is my shepherd? What a great passage of Scripture. I hope you know that shepherd. I really do. I hope you have a relationship with him. He loves you. He cared for you. And he gave his very best for you. And now again, as he nurtured and cared for you, I hope and pray that it's reflected in the walk that we demonstrate every day of our life. May he see that. May others see that. And it's all for his glory. Well, that's kind of reminiscing to last week. Today we're going to move toward the Lord is my salvation. And you'll see that here from the same psalmist, David, in Psalm 27. Let's ask God's blessing on the ministry of his word, and then we're going to take up the text that's before us. Father, uh, we are somewhat uh, moved, stirred by the reminder of what a great God and shepherd that we have in you, your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for loving us and caring for us and meeting our need when we couldn't, or really no one else could meet that need. You met our need, the greatest of needs, by way of paying for our sin debt and paid for it in full. So grateful again for that kind of love, that kind of demonstration of the good shepherd who was willing to lay down his life for his sheep. And Lord, I would pray that all here are part of that flock. I pray that all are truly sheep that are more than just acquainted, but very familiar with the shepherd, the God that we're speaking to at this moment. And I pray, Father, that we hear your voice on a regular basis. May we be ever so sensitive to it. I pray that we would hear your voice today by way of your word and by way of this preacher. I pray that the things that are shared are the things that need to be shared. And I pray that we walk away challenged, uh, yea, changed, as for your glory. We're going to thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. So here we are in the month of September, and anybody remember what our theme is for the month of September? The theme is what? Yes, three of you. I heard three. One, two over here. That's it. Three of you. And if you ever get lost or distracted, you can read, I assume, and they are all to my right, to your left, on the wall there. So we're really talking about the confidence that we would get from the Psalms. Do you get confidence from reading the Word of God? I would hope that you do. I, I would hope that, again, that... That, uh, that, that you would understand that it's not about me, it's about the Lord, and I can trust him and believe in him, and I'm confident that what he is doing, he makes no mistakes, and he's got my perfect interest in mind, and on and on and on it goes. But we're taking it from the whole book of the Bible and boiling it down to just one particular book, and that would be the book of Psalms. And we're only going to look at it for this week as well. Last week, again, the Lord is my shepherd. This week, the Lord is my salvation. Look at Psalm 27, the first three verses of this psalm here. And I, I just want to look at a couple of these things quickly, and then we're going to jump around a little bit. The Bible says, again, written by David. You see that there in the superscription, so you know who the author is. And again, that's very important. 
Uh, it's important because you can kind of identify with David. What, did, what was David's like, uh, life like? What did he experience? And uh, here's what I like to remind people. David was made of the same material that you and I are. He had flesh. He had blood. He had challenges. He had weaknesses. He had strengths. He wasn't some superhuman individual. He was used of God. Uh, he was an ordinary person serving an extraordinary God. And so David here, a shepherd, uh, certainly again uh, writing and trying to encourage those that will be the recipients of this particular psalm here, uh, knows something about what he's talking about here. And so look what he says here in Psalms 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, camped or came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Let me just ask you, did David have enemies? He had plenty of enemies. He had the king of Israel hunting him down like some dog. I mean, the king was jealous of David. He, he despised him, tried to kill him right there in his own palace. I mean, I was, I was recalling some of these instances, and I'm going to share some. Who goes to dinner with a javelin in their hand? I mean, really, honestly? I mean, who does that? Only one that's out for somebody, and that would be the king after one of his, his uh, people that are sitting at his table, one that he even adopted into his family as, as his own son, yea, certainly a son-in-law. He's sitting here with a javelin just waiting for the opportunity. Uh, I can't imagine. Closest I can get to that is uh, I remember sitting at the table, and my father taught us manners, and I am ever so grateful for the manners that I learned sitting at that table. And I learned a few things over the years, and maybe my hands show it. I don't know. But you never reached for something. If you wanted something, you asked. And you asked politely. There was a right way. Uh, you would address the individual that you're talking to. So you wouldn't just say, hey, pass the, 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 uh, the, the bread or the butter or whatever. It's, if it's a cross and, and my brother has it, Tom, would you please pass the butter? And you didn't reach for it. You asked for it, and then it would be properly passed to you. I've learned over the years, if you forgot your manners and tried to reach for that in front of my father, you might get the back of a fork in your hand as you're going across his plate. You might all of a sudden get some prongs all of a sudden in your hand saying, that's not what we do at this dinner table here. And, uh, and so you might think, well, that's cruel and inhumane. No, I'll tell you what, it only took one or two forkfuls, and you learned real fast. You ask for certain things around this place here. And so just little things like that, I am, again, forever grateful. Now, I've got to stop and think if I ever put a fork in any of my kids' hands. I'm not quite sure. But we tried to implement those same rules with regard to uh, how to approach a table in a proper way. Well, I say that in vain. I don't think my dad ever came with a javelin, and I'm sure happy for that. But David certainly had his enemies from the king all the way down to various people there within his empire. And so when he says in verse 2, he knows something about what he's talking about. When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Isn't that a wonderful testimony? That's a, that's a great statement that he's making. Hey, listen, that ought, to, that ought to ensure and stir up confidence in us. If David had enemies that fell... How about our enemies? Could they not fall the same way? The answer is, of course, yes. Look what he says. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war shall rise against me, in this will I be confident. And then he goes on and says uh, a couple things uh, from thereafter. I was, even, uh, I was just even glancing at that idea, this host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. And I want to pick up on that word fear and afraid here in just a minute. I was, again, reviewing uh, just a number of passages of Scripture. One of my favorite is in the book of uh, 2 Kings, chapter 6. It's dealing with the prophet Elisha, not Elijah. And so Elijah is uh, encamped uh, there in, uh, I forget the name of the town here real quick, but anyway, there he is, and the, and the king of Syria is after this guy. He, here, here's again, here's a man of God, Elisha, despised, by some secular king because he is prophesying truth. And, and listen, people who don't want to hear the truth don't like those that tell the truth, all right? So that's just the way it is. They don't want to hear the truth. You know, we would say if the shoe fits, wear it. Uh, but the king didn't want to wear it. He didn't like it. 
And so he tried to capture Elisha on a number of occasions. And Elijah was always a step ahead of them because God revealed it to Elisha as to what the king was doing. So it's like, who's telling this guy? And, uh, and, and uh, he gets word that it's, there's a God in heaven who's revealing all this. Anyway, they pin him down. They think they got him this time. Here comes the king and his whole army. And they got him down there. And now uh, this is a big paraphrase. And Elijah comes out and, uh, no, uh, his, I can't remember which one, his servant. I think his servant comes out and he sees this, this army that's encamped around the town. I mean, they got us pinned down. There is no escaping. Where are we going to go? And Elisha says something to the effect like, what are you worried about? There, there's more of us than there are them. And this guy's scratching his head. I mean, it's like, Elisha, you, you might still be dreaming. You're, maybe you're still sleeping. Something's, something's not quite right. And all of a sudden, God opens up the eyes of this prophet, and he looks out, and he sees the host of God's army surrounding the army of the Syrians. And all of a sudden, it's like, wow, where'd they come from? Hey, they were there all along. Hey, though this host is encamped against me, my God is bigger than they are. My God is there. He's right there in the midst of this battle here. So they're smitten with blindness, and they're taken up to Samaria. And Elijah's a pretty nice guy. You know, usually you take those guys, you want to kill them or whatever. Or something. Hey, they were after me. And he says, no, we're not going to do that. We're just going to send them back to, uh, to Syria and send them on their way. And so these guys live to see another day. But the whole point of that is I'm looking at this, verse 3, Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Hey, folks, have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a situation you think, there is absolutely no way out of this. I mean, what am I going to do? I'm overwhelmed. Sometimes all we can see is the mountaintop and fail to realize that, hey, listen, we've got to take some gradual steps to get up to that top. If you just stand there and look at the mountain and do nothing, you'll go nowhere, and you'll be overwhelmed. But what people of faith do, people that have confidence in God, is they begin to climb that mountain. And lo and behold, before you know it, there you are. You've reached the pinnacle. You're on top. And it's not so bad once you get up there. But I think this particular psalm really oozes with, again, a lot of confidence. And I really want us to look at some of those, again, the phrase back in verse 1, the Lord is my light. There's no ambiguity. There's no confusion. He didn't say the Lord is my light sometimes. He goes on and says, he's my salvation. There's our title, the Lord is my salvation. And by the way, when salvation is used here in Scripture, it is not always dealt with in a spiritual sense with regard to a, a deliverance from my sin, my bondage of sin. The word salvation simply means deliverance. And so God will deliver us from our enemies. He'll deliver us from uh, despair and discouragement. God can deliver us in a number of different ways, certainly the, the realm of our bondage of sin. But that's not always what salvation means in Scripture. And so the Lord is my salvation. It's my deliverer. My God is able to deliver me. And uh, we'll sing that, I believe, even as we close. And then he goes on and says, The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So you see it three times. Fear in verse 1. Uh, whom shall I fear? Afraid in verse 1. Whom shall I be afraid? And then over here in verse 3, My heart shall not fear. So what that did was it took me on a little excursion here. I took a little trip and I went back. And I said, You know, I think I preached on fear not that far back. And sure enough, about a year ago, I preached some of these messages, and so I'm giving you some of the excerpts that, uh, that, I, that I shared about a year ago. And, and I don't always do this, but I thought it would be applicable in the, in the sense of saying, our goal is to see that our confidence comes from God, uh, we ought not be a people at fear, and yet I think I kind of have the pulse of mankind as a whole, and that is that we are fearful, that we are people that really are fearful in a lot of different ways, and it shows up in a lot of different ways. And there's lots of different ways of fearing. Uh, and every stage along the way, from a child to the oldest person here, has fear. You know, as a child, do you remember as a child? What, what was your biggest fear as a child? I, I can tell you what mine was. Darkness. I hate it, I hate it at nighttime. I didn't like darkness. All the lights go out, that's kind of like, ooh, this is booky. I don't know. I mean, I just, I didn't like darkness. 
And then you go to bed. And I remember one time, I, I probably told you this story too. I remember being in bed. It was night. And I heard the fire engines. And it's like, oh, is our house on fire? I mean, what would make me think that? I have no idea. My house never, well, not my house. My parents' house did catch fire, I guess. But, but not while I was there with them. But you, you just have those, so, so a child, you have certain fears. Hey, how about, how about our seniors? Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. What would be some of the fears that they would entertain? How about things like health? Uh, maybe, how about the fear of, like, being lonely? Uh, how about maybe the fear of being able to pay bills, especially when you're on fixed incomes and things of like that? Hey, listen, I don't care which spectrum. Pick whichever, and all in between, there's fear. I do not believe with all of my heart, God, folks, that God intended us to go through life fearful. I hate the word fear, and I've maybe learned a few things over the years, but I don't want to fear. I, don't, I, I want to have my confidence in my God who is my light, my salvation, my strength. Why should I be afraid? What should I be afraid of? Is not my God bigger than all of these things? Yes. So I don't want to be a, for, a person who, who is fearful. Now, I know that there's, I know there's, a, there's a good fear and a bad fear. I, I know there's some, some healthy fears. I've shared with you before, you know, there's a healthy fear of heights. Uh, and, and, you know, I find that the older I get, the, more that, the, the higher those places get. Uh, you know, there, there was a day that I didn't have any problem getting on a roof uh, and cleaning out gutters. And now I'm looking, and, and it's not so fa- bad looking up. It's when you're up looking down. Uh, all of a sudden it looks like, man, that is pretty far down there. And the mind begins to go. I, I, was, I was looking at something the other night on Facebook. This is really phenomenal. I just like, so one of our friends on Facebook, whatever, they sent a picture of their daughter, or granddaughter, I think it was, that's sitting on this cliff. I mean, and it is up there. It is out there. I should show you the picture afterwards. And she's just sitting there dangling her legs. There is nothing but this rock and, and probably hundreds and hundreds of feet below. Nothing. And just looking, I was queasy looking at the picture. I'm looking at that thing. Oh, I, don't, oh, I can't even look at that anymore. I'm just thinking, how do, you, how do you get out to that edge? You know, it's like there's no safety ropes. There's no harness. There's nothing. That's nothing. It's like, now, you know what? As a kid, they probably run out there. And as a parent, I was like, uh, I used to like Ferris wheels. I, I used to like Ferris wheels. I, I don't care if I ever get in a Ferris wheel again in my life. I don't mind the, when it's going around. I just don't like stopped at the top. And uh, this is kind of be payback. My wife should put me in one of those things because I tortured her for many years on these different rides. I have, really have. It's amazing she survived all these years. And, and the crazier and the dizzier, the better it was, at least I thought. Not so much for her. She should put me in a Ferris wheel and get me all up time and just start rocking that thing. It's like, ah, I don't do that. So my, my bottom response, I'm just not going up anymore. I don't, I don't, I'll just say, wave to you. I'll keep an eye on you. You just go. So, so uh, things change. I understand that. So there's some healthy fear in that. But, but when it comes to stepping out for God, when it comes to your walk with God, when it comes to your trust in God, do you fear or are you trusting Are you confident that our God is bigger than whatever it is that you're facing? Are you really? So why do we fear health? Why do we fear finances? Why do we fear we lose a job? Why do we fear? Is not our God bigger? Hey, I heard a story to this end here, and and I'm camping on fear for a good reason here, because I just want us to understand this. I heard a story... um, Imagine this. Imagine, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're walking down the streets in New York one day, and all of a sudden you come across some guy named Bill Gates. I don't know, some guy Bill Gates. I mean, you ever hear of a guy named Bill Gates? And for whatever reason, you strike up a conversation with Bill Gates. And, uh, and uh, you know, you just kind of hit it off. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, who am I to talk to Bill Gates, right? Like, Somebody said that Bill Gates is so busy, if you line this whole aisle of $100 bills, he doesn't have the time to stop and pick up those $100 bills. That's how much money the guy is raking in per minute, I guess. I don't know. I mean, he's a pretty wealthy guy. We all know that, right? So for whatever reason, I strike up a conversation with Bill Gates, and I begin to talk to him, and we kind of hit it off. And he said, hey, listen, I'd really like to continue this conversation. How about if we do lunch? 
He said, I got some appointments, but hey, how about if we meet tomorrow at McDonald's at uh, 12 o'clock? McDonald's? You say, no, no, he wouldn't ask you to go to McDonald's. Uh, I might go to McDonald's, but he wouldn't go to McDonald's. So he's going to pick some fancy restaurant and say, hey, let's just meet at this restaurant tomorrow noon right here in Manhattan. We'll, we'll get together and have some... You get together tomorrow at noon. Now, first of all, you say, well, let me check my schedule to see if I'm really available for you. I don't know if I can really fit you into my schedule. Are you kidding? You're going to clear your schedule. I'm going to meet with Bill Gates tomorrow at noon for lunch, some fancy restaurant in Manhattan. And you go for lunch. And I'm telling you, you just have the time of your life. I mean, it's just like, it's like you have so much almost in common, <laughs> except the dollars and cents, a few things along those lines, but you have a lot of other things in common. And he said, you know, I have thoroughly enjoyed getting to know you a little bit more. I'd like to take this to another level. I'd love to meet your wife, your family, whatever it is. He, he said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to send my private jet into the Newark airport, pick you up. How about maybe next week at uh, Tuesday at, at, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and they're going to fly out to my little mansion out here in Seattle somewhere, and, and uh, I'll have somebody at the airport pick you up and bring you on out. And he's like, whew, let me check my schedule, see if I'm available to be able to do that. I don't know. I'm a pretty busy guy here. He's like... Are you kidding? You're going to go. And so you're there. You get on this little private jet. You fly out to Seattle. You meet him in his mansion. You have a wonderful time. Everything goes well. I mean, you, you're, you're just firing on all eight. It's like you've known this guy now forever. He said, uh, you know, I, I like it. So let's do this again. And you do it again. And you do it again. And you do it again. Now, now Bill Gates is almost like family. I mean, like, he's my brother. I mean, hey, we're, we're really tight. And Bill then all of a sudden drops this bomb on you. He said, he, he said, now listen, he said, I don't know if you noticed or not. He said, but I have a couple dollars to my name. And he said, I'd really like to help you out with some of your financial expenses. He said, do you have any expenses? Do you have any needs? Anybody here have any needs? No, I have no needs, uh, sir. No, I, I, I'm in good shape. He said, you got a mortgage? Oh, I got a few dollars there. I owe. Huh? You got any car payments? I eh, got a few of those. Got all the debts? I eh, got a few of those. He says, I'll tell you what, here's $500,000. Take care of some of your needs. Hey, if you need more, just let me know. Just let me know. <laughs> uh, well, let me think. All right, I'll take your check. All right. Sure it's not going to bounce? Uh, no, no. All right. So you take his check. You cash. You pay all of your debts. And this saga continues on. All of a sudden, one day you go to work. And the boss calls you into the office, and he says, uh, hey, listen, I got some bad news. He said, we are downsizing as a company, and we're going to let you go. What's your response going to be like at that point in time? Do you think you're going to be really beside yourself? Do you think you're really going to be, like, really upset? You might be upset because you really enjoyed your job. You might have to relocate. There might be some... But do you think there's going to be this heavy weight that's hanging over your head? How am I going to make my monthly payments? Uh, how am I going to how am I going to meet my my financial needs? I don't think those things are going to be on the tip of our mind or the tip of our tongue or I don't think you're gonna, you know why? Because there's a pretty incredible friend of yours that has more than enough to meet your need and many others needs. And so you walk away saying, "Oh well, I got a pink slip. Not what I asked for, but I'm not worried." I'm not fearful. Take that and apply it to any situation. The greatest oncologist in the world is a personal friend of yours, and you've been diagnosed with cancer. I mean, can you, can you already, already see the things that are happening in your mind? What's going to happen? What's going to... Hey, listen, this oncologist assures you that the success rate of his treatments or her treatments are just off the charts. Uh, we've tried some experimental things, and I'm telling you, listen, I really believe that you got, we can get this thing under control. You going to fear? You can play that scenario out, but here's what I want you to understand. Isn't there somebody greater than the greatest oncologist that walks the face of the earth? Isn't there somebody greater than a Bill Gates that you know and has got everything under control? Isn't there? Yes, there is! His name is God. He's God. Why? Why then do we fear? That's what he's asking. He's pretty confident. The Lord is my light and my salvation. There, again, no confusion. But here, 
Whom shall I fear? If God is my light and my salvation, who is there to fear? He goes on and says, the Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Let that soak in. Next time you and I are challenged with various needs, concerns that would arise and overcome us. Hey, listen, folks, fear is real. It will paralyze you if you allow it. It will paralyze you. Paralyze you in the sense that it will not enable you to really go on and be all that God wants you to be. If you live in the realm of fear, not trusting, afraid of, again, what could happen, if you live there, you'll never accomplish much for the glory of God. I guarantee you. Why? Because you're, you're paralyzed. Here's one of the stories I read uh, a couple years ago, and I really like it. It's uh, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this, and again, there's pros and cons with Bonhoeffer, and I'll say all of that and save that for another day. But Bonhoeffer was a man that lived d during um, uh, the, the early stages of Hitler taking over Europe, and Germany in particular, where he was from. And uh, he preached a number of messages. One of the messages he preached, though, was right out of the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. It is the story of uh, Christ in the boat, sound asleep on a pillow, and a storm arises there at the, on the sea. And the waves are, are, are crashing up against the boat. In fact, they're actually overtaking the boat, and the wind is blowing, and the disciples are afraid they're going to die. So I pick up in the middle of the story here with the fierce struggle with the waves, the storm, wind blowing harder by the minute. The boat is tossed about like a toy. The sky is dark. The sailor's strength is falling. Then all of a sudden, one grips them. Whom? What, what are you? He cannot tell. But someone is there in the boat who wasn't there before. Someone comes close to him, lays cold hands on his arms as he pulls on his oars. He feels his muscles freeze. He feels the strength just zapped, gone, taken away from him. I mean, here I am, I am rowing hard, and all of a sudden it's like I, I can't even move. My strength is gone. And who is this that got in the boat? He wasn't here a little while before. Then the unknown one reaches down into his heart and into his mind and magically brings forth the strangest pictures. You know what flashes before his mind? His family. He begins to see his wife. He sees his kids. He hears his kids crying. His mind is going crazy. What's going to happen to them? Then he sees some of his yesteryears and some of the evil ways that he had had, even some of his more recent days where he had an angry word maybe for a neighbor or so. And suddenly he can no longer see or hear anything. The waves are overwhelming the ship. And he cries out, Stranger, in this boat, who are you? And the others answer, I am fear. Now the cry goes up from the whole crew. Fear is in the boat. All arms are frozen. They drop their oars. All hope is lost. Fear is in the boat. All the while, they're failing to realize there's somebody else in this boat. There's somebody else in this boat. The heavens open. The heavenly hosts themselves raise a shout of victory in the midst of hopelessness. Look! Look! It's Christ! The one who will never leave you nor forsake you. The one who is right there with you, right alongside of you. Christ is in the boat. And no sooner the call goes forth, fear shrinks back. The waves subside. The sea becomes calm. Christ is with me. He's in the boat. He asked them, why are you so fearful? How is it? You have no faith? Do you realize that fear and faith are diametrically opposed? They are polar opposites. When you are fearful, you have to do a checkup real fast. Where did my faith all of a sudden disappear to? Why am I so fearful? What happened here? 
They cannot coexist. It's either fear or it's faith. Which will it be? Hey, David, David knows something about turmoil. He knows something about trouble. And he's very clear. No, no, the Lord is my light. He is my salvation. He is my strength. I have nothing, nothing to be afraid of. Well, we could look at a number of places of Scripture, but for the sake of time, I want to jump maybe here to the end. And I want you to just see this idea of the light here and, and uh, trust that the Lord will bless our time as we kind of wrap it up. The Lord is my light. What is exactly David referring to here by that? Well, we know that light dispels darkness. And here's the thing, folks. I, I wanted to go so badly to the New Testament and quote you all the Bible verses that deal with, God, with light. For instance, Jesus is the light of the world, and, and we are children of light and we're to shine. And, and my mind wanted to go to the New Testament and give you a whole barrage of verses, but I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. David isn't in the New Testament. David is in the Old Testament. And David is saying at this point in his life that the Lord is his light just as much as Jesus Christ is our light. And so I had to go back, and I really had to, had, to, had to restrict my mind to thinking, where has David seen light? How could David say that, that the Lord is my light, and that this light of my Lord will dispel any darkness that comes into my life? So then I thought on a number of things. I thought, well, David, no doubt, probably had a grasp on history, uh, the history of Israel. After all, he is the, uh, the, 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 the second king of Israel. And so David, no doubt, was a student to some degree of how God has delivered the people of Israel over and over and over again. And how God did do that is often with light. For instance, remember when, uh, when they came out of Egypt and they were being led through the wilderness? Where was the light? Well, it was a light you could not miss. It was the Shekinah glory of God. It was, a, it was a, a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night. Again, symbolic of the very presence of God. There is the light. And this light is leading us through the wilderness. David, no doubt, knew some of those things. He had heard those stories. He might have even read those stories. So he certainly was well aware of, of that. Uh, he was no doubt certainly aware of some other things. Uh, uh, the inhabitants coming into the promised land and, and the various battles that uh, his forefathers fought in occupying the land that he is now presiding over. David was aware of, again, some of the history. But he was probably aware of a lot of things as well, even to the point that he wrote about it. And so I found it fascinating. I started looking at the Psalms. And I found that all of these psalms that deal with light were written by a guy named David. So David writes in Psalm 4, verse 6, he says, There may be many that say, Who will show us any good? Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Psalm 18, verse 28, David again says, For thou wilt light my candle. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Psalm 34 David said, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were lightened. Psalm 36. I could go on and on. Do you get the idea? David knew something about God being light. And because God was his light, it's going to dispel any darkness, any cloud of darkness, any cloud of, of, of fear that might overcome him. No, I'm not going to let it happen. The Lord is my light. All right, so let's go back to this idea here. I just thought came to my mind here. Uh, you remember when you were a child, again, and maybe you did have the fear of darkness? You may, some of you. By the way, how many, how many ever had fear of darkness? I mean, it's just only, only a handful of us, I guess. A um, bunch of cowards, I guess. I don't know. So do you know what your parents did to you in those times? Do you know what your parents did to you? you know what often will happen? Uh, maybe your parents didn't do this. Did they ever put the thing called a night light in your room? <gasps> All you needed was just a little bit of light, just a little bit of light. It was so reassuring. It's okay. might be dark, but there's a little light. Hey, David saw God as his light, and it dispelled the darkness. There was no clouds of gloom and doom. He goes on and says this, the Lord is my salvation. And again, this is my idea of God is uh, uh, David's deliverer. And again, quickly here, for the sake of time, hey, did David know anything about being delivered by God? In different instances? Well, I have a whole bunch of them, but I'll tell you a couple of them here real fast. David was delivered, the Bible says, out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear as he was shepherding sheep. Again, I think I shared that with you here maybe even last week. I just, I'm still mind-boggled with that. I, I don't know if I were a shepherd and saw some wolf come 
or some bear or lion attack my sheep, I would just say, well, I guess it's just one less we got in our, our flock here. I don't know. What are we going to do? I mean, who am I to go up against that? You see that lion? You see the teeth on that, the claws on that thing? Are you kidding? But David, David was, he was crazy. Somehow he attacked that lion, he attacked that bear, and God delivered him. So, so David was, he was fearless in a lot of these areas here. And again, you can run with that whole thing. Uh, then, then there was this, then, then David was just doing his, his, his father's beck and will. Hey, take some food up to your brothers and see how they're doing. And he shows up on the battlefront, and here is this monster. He's nine foot six, I believe it is. His name is Goliath. And I want to tell you something. The whole army of Israel was fearful of this guy. Not David. Not David. What? Where did this guy get his courage from? Hey, listen. And, and so he begins to solicit uh, uh, Saul, the king. Hey, listen, I'll go. Who are you? I mean, you're not even old enough to be in the army. And you're telling us you want to go face this giant? You know what David says? This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, as he says that to this giant. He says that right to his face. Goliath, you are nothing. My God is bigger than you are, and he's going to deliver you to me. David, do you know what you're talking about? See, folks, I, I, I want you to just think about this. We know the outcome of the story. We've read it. We love the story. We've, we've heard it a hundred times. So, so we say, oh, put yourself in the shoes of David at that moment facing this giant. Do you think there could have been an ounce of fear in him? Maybe just a little bit like, sure hope this works out. If it doesn't, I'm lunch. You know, I mean, I mean, think, I mean, think about him. See, I, again, we're so familiar with the story, I think we fail to understand that David was human. David was made of the same material. David wasn't subhuman. David was a man. In that case, he's just an older boy. And yet, Goliath didn't scare him. Bears and lions didn't scare him. The king of Israel didn't even scare him. He had the king, as it were, by the juggler on a couple of occasions. Could have just put the knife right through him, but he wouldn't do it. Hey, hey, David even had to run from his own family. I, I thought, boy, that's about as low as you can get. I mean, I, I could it get any worse? Your own flesh and blood wants to kill you? I mean, th th they're that hungry for power? They want you out of their world? So, so David's going to even run from a Absalom, as it were? Hey, I'll tell you something. There's a number of cases where this guy faced some challenges, and yet he says, the Lord is my salvation. He's my deliverer. Whom shall I fear? So here's the summary of the whole thing here, folks, real quick. Here's, here's your homework assignment, okay? You want some homework? You say, it's Sunday. It's a day off. It's Lord's Day. I know. Go home and just do this. Just reflect. In fact, I, I, really, I really want you to work hard at this here. I want you to go home, and I just want you to stop and think about some things. Where has God delivered you over the years? How has God delivered you? How good has God been to you? And I know that we generalize it. Oh, God is so good. That's true. How, specifically? Could you, could you write it down on a piece of paper? Could you go home and just tell me, you know, I remember this situation. Whew. That seemed like it was the biggest mountain you've ever faced, the biggest challenge in your life, and here you are on the other side of it. Could you do that over and over and over again. And here's why it's important. Do that because more challenges are coming your way. I have no idea what we're going to face this week. I have no idea what challenges are coming my way. I really don't. But I know this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Honestly. There's a history. There's a track record of God being good to me over and over and over again, and delivering me. Why should I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, and this idea of strength is, deals with this inner strength that nothing can resist, nothing can resist. Oh, folks, listen, I, it's simple. It's not profound, but I, 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 I beg of you. I really want, I want you to think and reflect on some of these things here today. Don't, don't, don't just go home and say, well, there's another message, and 
I know you got plans and you got activities and you all want to go home and eat and maybe you're going to watch uh, some ball games and all that kind of stuff, whatever. I don't know what your plans are. But will you just somewhere throughout the course of this day stop and think about how God has delivered you? Oh, it wasn't out of the paws of lions and bears and giants like Goliath, but he delivers. He delivers. And I would hope and pray that you would have a list. I, I think I wrote down maybe a dozen different instances in David's life. And, uh, and it condensed and shortened. That's just one guy. How about my life? That's, that's the personalization of Scripture. It's not just some, well, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be? Oh, we could quote it. Do we believe it? Do we really believe it? Is it real? How you'll know that? Hang around a while. I have no idea what's coming your way. But I dare say there will be some challenges in the weeks and months and years ahead. Could you run to Psalm 27 and quote it with all the gusto and faith that you can muster up, confident that my God is able? And I would hope and pray that that would be where you are. Amen? Amen. I really hope it is. Father, thank you for our time here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your word. It's just that. It's yours. It's not mine. There's just some simple, simple truths here, and yet profound. Oh, Lord. We are people who have our fears, our fair share of fear. And Lord, I believe that fear and faith uh, are polar opposites. Oh God, I ask you to help us to be a people who are confident in the God that we're speaking to even at this very moment. As I remind myself, Lord, there may be only one that's echoing these words, but I pray that they are the prayer of each and every heart that is here today. Lord, you are our light and our salvation. You are our strength. What do we have to fear? To whom do we need to be afraid of? Lord, I pray that uh, these words would come back to our mind and to our heart often. And Lord, for that, we certainly thank you. We would then say that it was been profitable to be in your house, to be with you and your people, to, to be reminded of a truth that, that we know and yet needed to be reminded of. And so, Lord, work that truth into the depths of our being. May we dispel darkness by way of our confidence, our faith, our trust in you. And, Lord, for that, we'll thank you. And, Lord, as we close in prayer, there may be some here today that know not Christ. And, Lord, I don't know who that could be, but you would know. There's some here today that are not saved. I pray that they would push the devil, as it were, off their lap because the devil would like to keep them in darkness. May they come to see Jesus Christ as their true deliverer, the deliverer from their bondage of sin that will keep them from a place in heaven. And so if salvation is the need of the hour, Lord, I pray you'd save souls spiritually from sin and from the consequences of it, an eternal separation from you. Save souls, Lord. And I, push, I pray they push pride and uh, false thinking uh, from, from their minds here today, and if salvation is the need, may they come to Christ. May today be the day of salvation. I want to personally thank you for joining us for our service today and the message that we just heard from God's Word. Here at Kendall Park Baptist Church, there's something for everyone. There's Sunday school classes for all ages, youth, teen, and young adult ministries with exciting activities and lessons that will draw you closer to Jesus Christ and a warm and welcoming congregation that loves people and loves the Lord. So while we're thankful that you've taken the time to view our service today, we hope that you won't stop there. Come by for one of our services on Sundays or Wednesday nights and see for yourself what makes this church truly special. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope to see you soon here at Kendall Park Baptist Church.